Production funding for Making It Up North is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. It's got a mixture of both jazz and, and comedy and musical theater all, all rolled into one. This is a, a period piece about the early 2000s now, but at the time <laughs> it was ripped from the yes, headlines. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come see opera singer Smoke. When does that happen? Of smoke. Sure. We're moving in Sunday morning at 8 a.m. We have to have the set built, all the costumes, all the props in, the orchestra set up, and have a downbeat at 4 o'clock that same day. Holy crap! Holy crap! Holy crap! <laughs> Anything could happen. <laughs> So we wanted to write a piece that uh, talked about uh, relationship ennui and tension within a household. Uh, and uh, we were younger at the time, and we were taking uh, <laughs> Hammerstein's advice that you should really adapt things before you start to write your own original story. Which is very good advice. Mm -hmm. So we found the story, there's an opera from 1909 called Il Segreto di Susanna, Susan's Secret, by Wolf Ferrari and uh, Golishani. And it is about a sneaky smoker. It is the template of this plot. Is and so our soprano's named Sue, mm -hmm. um, Susan, and Susanna is the... Mm -hmm. is and our the, gill is, is Guglielmo, from that, Guglielmo from that piece. And we brought it up to date because they had just instituted the smoking ban in New York in 2003. There's a rich uh, tradition of opera and musical theater rehearsing in church basements. They're big, uh, they usually have good acoustics, there's usually a piano in the corner, and they're usually free most of the time. I thought New Yorkers were supposed to be so badass. But take away their cigarettes, and they're like babies without their bottles. <laughs> My name is Marnie Robin. I'm the stage director for the double bill uh, of Trouble in Tahiti and The Filthy Habit. It's the Minnesota premiere of Filthy Habit, and uh, the composer and the librettist, they wrote it to pair with Trouble in Tahiti. It uses the same five singers, they sort of flip-flop roles, and they actually reorchestrated it so we could use our same seven players. The other orchestration of this is much larger. I think it's like 17 or 20 people. It's quite a large orchestra with a harp and a full string complement, and that's lovely. Um, but uh, that's rare that I'm going to get the luxury of hearing that orchestration um, in, in that size. So when, when Loon came and asked uh, for a smaller one to match this piece, which after all it's supposed to go with anyway, I, I jumped at the chance. He actually took part in our first rehearsal and was actually on, on Skype, that's never happened to me before, actually having a live composer on the end of the line, you know, oh, I've got a live one. Um, and he was, we were actually able to ask him direct questions like, oh, did you mean piano here or forte? Did you mean a sharp on this note? And you can ask him right away, boom, takes care of it. August of 2003. <laughs> 
Andrew Sewell and the orchestra or the band, they're more like a jazz band than anything, are just top shelf. It's not like your typical comedy opera and it's not your typical musical theatre. It's got a mixture of both jazz and, and comedy and musical theatre all, ri all rolled into one. We've only had a couple of rehearsals with the orchestra, and so we continue to learn and with each other uh, the piece and then how to perform the piece together. And this was a very, very tight uh, final dress, so I feel like we're really locking it in. So once you have the cigarette, you can also sing to the cigarette. And that, that plays really well. And then it gives you two focal points as well. I'm beginning to pull away now as a director. It's really becoming their show. Uh, and they, I just, we just sat for a note session. And so they have what to work on. And things are beginning to settle in, in a groove for them, in a pocket, blocking wise. We're very proud of the cast we have, fantastic singers, unbelievable actors. The sky is blue, the air is clean, free from tar and nicotine. Yeah, come see opera singers smoke. <laughs> well, I'm the one character who doesn't smoke. That's weird. I smell like... That can't be right. Cigarette smoke. Who sweats cigarette smoke? I've never seen that in Ben's health. So we're wrapped up now. We just did uh, our last rehearsal before we open on Sunday. It's not me. Where's it coming from? Well, I think being prepared, is it really takes a lot of the anxiety and the edge off, but there's always that nervous energy. The thing that I'm thinking right now is that I'm really ready to show this to an audience because I think they're going to have a great time. Loading is always the day where we have everybody. We hit the doors a little before 8, and luckily the doors were, were open. They said they'd be open at 8. They were open at 7.45. Every minute is going to help. And everybody pitches in. Um, you know, I'm doing costumes, but I'm also helping load stuff out of a truck, and, um, and people are helping me put together tables. and. We have the best volunteers ever in the whole world. Everybody pitches in and we kind of see how amazing and generous our community is. A lot of people come from uh, UMD, from just friends in the community, just people who enjoy doing this or want to help Loon out. So it's a real community effort. This is my home company, and so to be able to contribute even just one day is, I was all in. Today's a little unusual in that we have to, like, essentially tech in the space for the first time and figure it all out, and then have an afternoon opening. Anything could happen. <laughs> so we keep our scenery kind of simple. I'm Ann Gumper. I designed the set for Loon's Trouble in Tahiti and Filthy Habit. 
And this is uh, something that we had to sort of come up with on the fly. Like, how is this, how are we going to make this happen? And the fact that we have a show at 4 o'clock, it better work the first time. We don't usually do this. We usually have many days of technical rehearsals, and we can see how everything looks and adjust things. But in this case, we have a half a day. Fears are that we have these stationary panels, sort of Andy Warhol-like panels that Ann Gumper came up with. And I had to devise a way that they wouldn't shake when the actors walk past them. And we don't know that yet. We're so far on schedule, so I'm just going to compartmentalize any worry. It's not necessary right now. I'll, I'll be able to dip into worry if it's needed. <laughs> but it's, I'm not, not worried. Everybody's doing their job. My name is Ora Jill Bushy, and I am the costume designer, um, but I'm also a wig and makeup artist, so I do wigs and makeup for the show, too. This is what I do on my travel doing this for my job, so I'm lucky enough to do it in my hometown as well. I go through a lot of uh, office supplies. Everything that happens on the stage and everything that happens to the stage and behind the scenes goes into my book and so that there's just a one set of information so that if I disappear and somebody needs to take over, it's all there for them. My name is Audrey Rice and I'm the stage manager. It doesn't look like much right now, but at three o'clock, the audience will come in and it'll all be magically there. It's going well. The, we're almost ready for the actors to take the stage and walk through their, um, just hit all their marks. We don't get a tech rehearsal, so they'll just be walking their path and making sure that um, they know how much space they have, how much area they have to cover to get back on stage in time. So Trio, can we move into the poor Susan moment at the end? Then we will practice our little scene shifts and we don't get to hear it with the orchestra in this space, so we just trust that we've done all the work so it'll sound right. And the light cues will start to focus soon. They'll be doing that while we're on stage. My name is John Brophy, and I am the lighting designer. It's a challenge that I enjoy because it actually requires me to stretch my resources and, and to be creative in ways I don't normally have to be. So it's a, an exciting challenge to figure out. I gotta talk. The house will open a little late. Usually we're open for an hour in here, but we'll open just at half hour today to make sure we're all ready. And like buckets of paint are put away. Things like that. <laughs> I met with Sarah for rehearsal a couple weeks ago to just go through when the choreography was still fairly new. And there are so many things happening. She's doing administrative work and she's trying to learn her. Um, to learn the lyrics and learn the, the show, and, and she's wearing so many hats. And then, of course, Cal's, I don't know, he's probably working several other jobs himself, and 
um, keeping up with building sets and getting things ready to go on the stage. And it is a lot of work and there's all these different things that have to be done administratively and in small arts organizations there's usually a few people who do lots of different things. Mostly today I'm just thinking about being in it. Uh, we did things like run the door list and you know change the message on the box office phone and things like that. So there's some administrative things that I'm thinking about and then we just talked through the setup of the orchestra. I, I don't think we can move the baffle over. We were trying to approximate that in a church basement and so then the reality is just a little different but not much. So we did a lot of really good guessing. Sarah does so much uh, when it comes to organizing and making Loon run that when she comes into rehearsal, she says, hey, I just want to focus on being in my role right now. Um, and that's amazing that she can do that. I would just like for you to stand where you're going to stand to sheathe and unsheathe the knife, just so we have a memory of that in the space. And then we move on to Smoking Man. I'm the smoking man in The Filthy Habit. Um, Gil is having uh, sort of a daydream slash nightmare about his wife cheating on him with someone, some stranger that he's never met who smokes. And I come in and sort of personify his worst fears of what this man would be and what he's doing with his wife in the apartment. So it's a lot of fun. It's really kind of fun to, to play that role. We happen to be good at comedy, and it's because we learned from Colder by the Lake, and Margie Preuss and Jean Schrammick, and these people who built the foundation of comedy here, you know, in Duluth. And so we're so, so grateful to carry that banner for them. I mean, we're hell-bent on on subverting current expectations of opera. I think historically speaking, from the 17th century until fairly recently, a comic opera about contemporary subjects was par for the course. I mean, Normal, Mozart, yeah. yeah. Mozart wrote contemporary romantic comedies with a lot of funniness in them. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately that went away and it needs to come back. <laughs> <laughs> We're just able to do things because of love. People want this to happen, and amazingly talented people find a creative outlet here with some professional talent that is sort of leading the charge. That's the key, is surrounding yourself with good people on stage and off stage. One of our missions as a company is to provide paying work for professional musicians because we want them to live here. So we, we, we just want to provide work. 
And I think we feel that every aspect, every facet of our productions needs to be at the highest quality because people will notice. We make sure that we have the best costume designer and builders we can get. The, we have a world-class scenic designer and painter. Um, our orchestras are always top shelf. Our singers are always great. You know, that's, I mean, that's our, our goal. We must. We were given the opportunity to work for this company after its founder died. At that time, we were still in the middle of singing careers. So we would, and we still do, <laughs> sing for our supper and come here and um, build an opera company um, with the money we make elsewhere. <laughs> we bring it here. So we're making an opera company with the help of other opera companies. When we were handed the company, it was like, well, who's going to build the set? Well, I have a, you know, some saws and some drills, and I, you know, and uh, so working with Ann Gumper, our scenic designer, has been just a, a blessing because she actually she knows a lot about building theatrical sets. such a delight to hear the orchestra come in and uh, be so beautifully playing right off the bat and then all the singing so great and then the, the timing and the dancing and the mm -hmm. block. I mean after 14 years watching. we have to I mean at some point you have to let go right I suppose you have to let the, 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 the little birdie leave the nest so to come and see it be wonderful and be surprised like laugh out loud at a show that you've lived with for like half of your life and and have something be new and shocking enough to make you laugh out loud is a treat, is a treat. I teach at uh, two community colleges in the area and I had um, five students here last night and I think seven today and they all came up and said this was amazing, I didn't know I liked opera. There shouldn't be any shame in saying I liked opera. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to say you liked it, and then you can bring a friend. I'm sorry, Susie. I'm sorry, too. I didn't mean to be suspicious.